The fluorescent lights hummed quietly above my lab bench as I peered through the microscope, adjusting the focus for what felt like the thousandth time this week. Around me, the small research facility I'd built in a converted warehouse buzzed with the sounds of centrifuges and incubators, hardly the prestigious hospital setting my family expected a Zhang to work in. I'm Dr. Sarah Zhang, 35, and according to my family of renowned surgeons and specialists, I'm the disappointment who just does research. While they save lives in gleaming hospitals, I spent the last seven years pursuing what they called an impossible dream, finding a new treatment approach for aggressive autoimmune disorders. Still hiding in your lab, Sarah? My Uncle Robert's voice from last week's family reunion echoed in my head. When are you going to do some real medical work like the rest of us? The monthly Zhang family dinner had been particularly brutal this time. My father, Dr. William Zhang, chief of surgery at Memorial Hospital, had made sure everyone knew about my cousin Angela's recent promotion to head of cardiology. Meanwhile, I'd sat quietly, not mentioning the breakthrough we'd had in the lab just days before. My phone buzzed. Another message from Dad. The position in Memorial's clinical practice is still open. Time to stop playing with test tubes and join the real medical world. I ignored it, focusing instead on the cell cultures in front of me. Seven years of research, thousands of failed trials, and finally, we discovered something unprecedented. Something that could change how we treat autoimmune diseases forever. Dr. John. Maya, my lead research assistant, appeared at my shoulder. The new trial results just came in from the independent lab. They confirmed our findings. My hands trembled slightly as I took the report. The external validation we'd been waiting for. Proof that our treatment protocol wasn't just working, but working better than anything currently available. Have you told your family yet? Maya asked softly. She'd been there through all the ridicule, all the dismissive comments at medical conferences, all the funding rejections. They wouldn't understand, I replied, remembering last Christmas when my uncle had loudly proclaimed that researchers were just doctors who couldn't handle real patients. The irony was, I had handled real patients. I'd done my residency at one of the country's top hospitals, graduated first in my class from medical school. But watching patients suffer through treatments that were often as devastating as their diseases had driven me to look for better answers. My computer pinged, an email from the World Health Organization's Medical Research Board. The subject line made my heart skip. Breakthrough Treatment Protocol. Presentation Request. They want us to present at next month's Global Medical Innovation Conference. I told Maya, my voice barely steady. They're calling our research potentially revolutionary. Dr. John. Another voice, Tom from the Finance Department. You should see this. He handed me a tablet showing multiple incoming emails from pharmaceutical companies, research hospitals, and medical investment firms. Word was getting out about our results. They're all interested in licensing or partnership discussions, Tom explained. The preliminary offers, well, you should look at the numbers yourself. The figures made me sit down, more zeros than I'd ever seen in one place. But it wasn't the money that made my hands shake, it was the validation. Seven years of work, of being dismissed and doubted, were about to pay off. My phone buzzed again, this time a message from Dr. Chen, my old mentor from medical school. Just saw the preliminary data. This is extraordinary, Sarah. Your father called me asking about some position at Memorial. Should I tell him you're about to become one of the most important researchers in immunology? Not yet. I typed back. Let them find out with everyone else. Looking around my tiny lab which actually occupied 20,000 square feet of meticulously organized research space. I thought about all the times my family had dismissed my work, how they'd laughed when I turned down prestigious hospital positions to pursue research, how they called me wasteful for investing my inheritance in building this facility. The door chimed, courier delivery, the formal invitation to speak at the Pew Conference, along with the conference schedule. My presentation was slated for the main hall, right after the keynote address. Dr. Zhang, Maya called from the culture room. The Japanese research team is on the line. They're calling our protocol a paradigm shift in autoimmune treatment. Another email notification. The New England Journal of Medicine wanted to fast-track our paper for their next issue. Seven years of work was about to change the face of medicine. And my family still thought I was hiding from real medical work. My phone buzzed one more time. The family group chat announcing another dinner next week. 
celebrating Angela's new department leadership role. The message read, Everyone must attend. I smiled, thinking about the coup conference happening the same week, about the pharmaceutical company offers sitting in my inbox, about the patients who would soon benefit from our breakthrough. Maya, I called book tickets for the whole research team to Geneva. It's time to show the world what playing with test tubes can really accomplish. As I returned to my microscope, I thought about my grandfather's words when I first told him I wanted to pursue research. Sometimes the biggest impact comes from the quietest work. Little did my family know, their failed researcher was about to revolutionize their entire field, and I was going to enjoy every minute of their realization. The World Health Organization's conference hall in Geneva buzzed with anticipation. Thousands of the world's top medical professionals filled the auditorium, many watching the live stream screens in overflow rooms. My research team sat in the front row, Maya giving me a thumbs up as I adjusted my microphone. And now, the conference chair announced our special presentation on what's being called the most significant breakthrough in autoimmune treatment this decade. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Jean, presenting the Neural Immune Interface, a new paradigm in autoimmune disease treatment. In the middle of the audience, I spotted my cousin Angela, who'd flown in representing Memorial Hospital's cardiology department. Her expression shifted from confusion to shock as she recognized me on stage. She was already pulling out her phone no doubt messaging the family group chat. Seven years ago, I began, we started questioning the fundamental approach to autoimmune disease treatment. Instead of merely suppressing the immune system, what if we could retrain it? The next 45 minutes flew by as I presented our research, the breakthrough treatment protocol, the clinical trial results, the patient recovery rates that had initially seemed too good to be true. In conclusion, I said, showing the final slide, we're seeing an 87% complete remission rate in conditions previously considered irreversible. The treatment protocol has been independently verified by research teams in four countries, and we're beginning broader clinical trials next month. The applause was deafening. In the key and a session that followed, leading medical researchers from around the world praised the innovation of our approach. The WHO's chief medical officer called it a revolution in autoimmune treatment. My phone was flooding with notifications. The family group chat had exploded. Dad. Sarah's presenting at who do? Uncle Robert. Turn on the medical conference live stream now, Angela. She's here. Her research. It's incredible. Aunt Marie. CNN is calling it a medical breakthrough. As I left the stage, I was swarmed by pharmaceutical executives, hospital directors, and research foundations. In the crowd, I spotted Angela trying to reach me. Sarah, she called out, her voice carrying a note of desperation. Why didn't you tell us? Would you have listened? I asked quietly, or would you have called it playing with test tubes again? Before she could respond, I was whisked away to a press conference. The next few hours were a blur of interviews, partnership discussions, and congratulations from the world's top medical professionals. That evening at the conference gala, my phone rang, Dad. The Memorial Hospital Board just watched your presentation, he said, his voice uncharacteristically subdued. There, they're calling an emergency meeting to discuss establishing a research division. They want you to run it. I have my own lab, Dad. Sarah, please. We were wrong. What you've done. It's extraordinary. Yes, I agreed, watching pharmaceutical executives line up to discuss licensing deals with Maya. It is. And I did it without Memorial's help. The next morning, the magnitude of our breakthrough hit the mainstream media. Revolutionary autoimmune treatment could help millions, read the New York Times headline. My inbox filled with messages from patients desperate to join the clinical trials. A week later, I stood in my lab, my increasingly famous lab, looking at the offers that had poured in. Research grants, partnership proposals, speaking engagements. The small facility I'd built with my inheritance was about to become a major medical research center. The door chimed. My father stood there, looking older and humbler than I'd ever seen him. I came to apologize, he said, taking in the sophisticated equipment and busy researchers. We were so focused on traditional medicine, on what we thought success looked like, that you couldn't see there are many ways to save lives. I finished. He nodded, picking up a journal with our research on the cover. Your grandfather would have been proud. He always said the best doctors were the ones who thought beyond the obvious. Funny. I smiled. He told me something similar when I started this journey. 
Over the next few months, everything changed. The clinical trials expanded globally. Our treatment protocol became the new standard for autoimmune disorders. Patients who'd suffer for years found hope in our research. My family's attitude transformed too. Uncle Robert stopped talking about real medical work when a patient in his own practice went into complete remission using our protocol. Angela collaborated with us on a cardiac application of our research. Even my father admitted that sometimes the quietest work makes the loudest impact. One year after the WHO conference, I stood in our new research facility, a state-of-the-art campus dedicated to immunology innovation. The original warehouse lab remained at its heart, a reminder of where we started. Dr. Zhang, Maya called, excited. The latest trial results just came in. The success rate is holding steady at 89%, and we're seeing applications for other conditions we hadn't even considered. I smiled remembering all the dismissive comments about wasting time in a lab. Now, our research was helping patients worldwide, inspiring a new generation of medical researchers, and changing how the medical community approached autoimmune treatment. My phone buzzed. A message from Dad. Saw another patient recover using your protocol today. Thank you for not listening to us. Later that evening, as I worked late in my office, I found an old photo of my grandfather in his lab from the 1960s. He'd been an innovator too, though his ideas were dismissed in his time. On the back, he'd written, The future of medicine lies not in following paths, but in forging new ones. I pinned the photo next to our framed WHO conference presentation. Success wasn't about proving my family wrong. It was about proving my grandfather right. Sometimes the greatest medical breakthroughs come not from following tradition, but from daring to question it. The lab hummed with activity even at this late hour, researchers working on new applications of our discovery. We weren't just treating patients, we were changing the future of medicine itself. And that was worth more than all the hospital chief positions in the world. As I reviewed the latest research data, a new email arrived. The Nobel Committee requesting information about our work. I smiled, thinking of all those family dinners where they pitied the fatal doctor who chose research over practice. Sometimes the biggest success stories start in the quietest labs with someone brave enough to pursue what others call impossible. And sometimes the best revenge isn't proving others wrong, but proving yourself right in ways that help millions of people. After all, isn't that what medicine is really about?